thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. It's the first time I've been in Oklahoma since I was probably about 10, 11 years old. So um, it's nice to be back. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about sheep and goat nutrition. If I don't hit on something that you wanted to hear about, I have my email at the end of this. So feel free to shoot me an email about anything and everything. Um, also, if I say something that you have no idea what I'm talking about, also feel free to interrupt me because um, I'm guilty of that a lot of times. Um, but a little bit about me before I start talking about this. I'm originally from Alabama. Um, grew up North Alabama. We had goats until I was about 13, 14 years old. Um, honestly, the only thing I really knew about them from that experience was that they were a pain and my mom hated them because they ate her rose bushes. So I'm not, that is not where I became um, knowledgeable about sheep or goats. Um, but worked for a vet in North Alabama for a long time, seven, eight years, and um, thought I wanted to go to vet school. So um, I went to a really small school, private college in um, northwest Georgia um, called Berry College. Um, largest campus in the world, but only had about 1,200 students there. Um, but the largest major was animal science. And so I, I was an animal science major, uh, once again, focused on vet school, was working at a beef cattle unit because I thought I was going to be a large animal, majority beef vet. And um, they, my boss at the beef unit said, well, we have this sheep barn and we really need someone to manage it. And I said no about five times. And, you know, because I wanted to work with beef cattle. And um, then he kept begging me and kept begging me and told, told me he'd give me a raise if I went and did it. So I reluctantly took over the sheep barn and I fell in love with sheep and started doing some undergrad research and realized how much I loved research and um, kind of made the veterinary thing seem a little boring to me. Um, sorry if there's vets out there, but um, it just totally kind of changed the track of um, my career and my focus and everything. So I... Um, went on to do a master's and PhD at North Dakota State because they were the only program really in the country that was doing exactly what I wanted to do, but in sheep. Um, and I wanted to look at nutrition and how that affects um, the reproductive success or non-success of sheep. And um, so I spent six years there doing research, um, doing a lot of extension because I was actually at a research extension center in Western North Dakota, not on campus. Um, so I was closer to South Dakota and Montana um, than actually Minnesota or the eastern part of North Dakota. Um, so spent a lot of time with sheep producers doing ram tests and all kinds of stuff like that. So um, really enjoyed that. And when I finished my PhD about six months later, I moved to Manhattan, started working at K-State as the sheep and meat goat specialist. Um, and it's been really great so far. And I um, have really enjoyed the change of scenery because um, it's very different being back kind of down south a little bit. And I know Kansas says they're not the south, but compared to North Dakota, they are. Um, so as much as they want to deny it. And I will say I accidentally wore orange today. This was not on purpose, but we'll pretend it was um, <laughs> for all the Okies in here. But, um, and I do hate the Sooners because I am an Alabama fan. So Oh, I was hoping everyone was going to be, yeah, yeah. so I'll say it's Auburn colors because we're doing really well in the tournament right now, so, um, but anyway, so now on to nutrition, we'll talk a little bit about this, but, okay, so I do have some questions throughout, and I have some, like, work gloves to give away to people that answer questions, so be loud, I guess. Um, so a little bit first of why do we even care about nutrition, and I'm sure all of you probably know this, but um, sheep and goats both are um, highly diverse species within themselves, which is what drew me to them. Um, we can, of course, harvest meat from them, but also fiber from both goats and sheep, um, as well as a lot of specialty milk and cheeses, um, which is really cool. Uh, but then also the lifestyle part of both livestock species, of course, on the show side of things, both species are just exploding. Um, but whichever one of these focuses that we have with those species, we 
can improve that by having adequate or supplemental nutrition. So in general though, um, does any, can anyone tell me what nutrition is? Um, but the fancy kind of definition that I use is the sum of the processes by which an animal takes in and assimilates the nutrient that we feed it. So if we break that down, it's all of the different actions that once the animal consumes feed, its body is gonna take on that feed and break it down and then take in all of those different nutrients and push it to different parts of its body, whether it's gonna produce fiber or milk or meat. Um, and it's gonna take all those nutrients in in a different way and utilize them to do whatever we hope it's going to do. Sometimes they take it and do things with the <coughs> nutrients we don't want them to do, but that's a different story. Um, but hopefully with correct and adequate nutrition, they're gonna produce what we want them to. Okay, so overview of anatomy, I'm not gonna go into this a lot, but when they take in the feed, it goes down the esophagus, just like us. Um, but then the rumen is like a huge fermentation vat. So if any of you make home brew or drink beer or whiskey or <coughs> use distiller's grains from ethanol, or maybe you grow corn or sorghum for ethanol. Um, that whole process to make all of those products is kind of like a giant rumen. Because. So it goes into the rumen from the No, 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 no. It's going to go through actually all of them except for the abomasum. Abomasum is last. So the abomasum is like our stomach. Highly acidic. Um, it's where a lot of the quick breakdown is gonna happen because it's like our stomach. But the rumen is what makes them special. That's why we call them small ruminants or cattle ruminants because it really separates them from a lot of other species of animals. Uh, because that rumen, just like the big fermentation vats they use for beer and whiskey <coughs> and ethanol, it has a lot of water in it and it has all of the feeds that we're gonna feed them, so the grains and the hay and all that stuff. But what makes it so special is that they have all of those microbes. So all the bacteria uh, and just tons and tons of bugs that are actually gonna break down that feed because they need the nutrients too. That's the environment that they live in. So they're gonna break down all of those feeds and then use it for themselves. So if you ever talk like, if you hear people talk about vegetarians and how they need B12, supplemental B12, well, it's because they're not eating red meat. And that's, so red meat is the only natural source of B12 because those bugs are actually making B12 in the rumen. So that's what makes them so, they're so, it's fascinating to me. That's why I do nutrition though. So, um, but uh, yeah, so it separates them from everything. And so th those bugs are not only making B12, but they're gonna break down all of the different nutrients. Um, and then those feeds that are further broken down are gonna go into the ome or the abomasum and then go into the small intestine, which just like us is where they're gonna absorb a lot of the nutrients that the bugs haven't gotten. So if you ever like are sitting down reading a nutrition book, which maybe some of you do, um, if you ever see where it says like rumen undegradable protein, which maybe you have seen that, maybe not, um, or rumen bypass protein, there's a lot of different terms for it now. People are trying to get fancy with it, but that just means that those are nutrients or protein that's going to bypass the rumen. So you're not feeding the bugs, you're going to actually feed the sheep or the goat with that. And so that's what we have to consider when we feed ruminants is that we're feeding the bugs and the animal. Acidosis, that fun little thing, acidosis, is actually when we convert our feed over too fast from one thing to another, usually from hay or a forage, roughage source, to grain. And that's because those, we didn't give those bugs time to change. So that whole population, we can shift it and not make the animal sick, but if we shift it too fast, then they get sick. So, and it's just because the microbes can't switch that fast. It actually takes them anywhere from three days to two weeks to adapt. So, which I'll talk about that more in a minute. Yeah, so yeah, anytime we switch feed too fast, we can run into issues with, and it's just mainly because of the bugs. So, yeah, it's 
pretty pretty interesting. Um, yeah, I'll talk about more about that here in a minute. But so I um, always kind of like this picture that people call it the nutrition puzzle. So we have the feed nutrients on one side, so protein, energy, minerals, the classic things that we think of when we think about what we're going to feed in a diet. Um, and then the animal requirements on the other side. So some of our animals are going to be on maintenance type rations. We don't need them to grow. They're not pregnant. So typically, late spring through the summer, we're on a maintenance type ration. Um, but then we have the growth periods, of course, for the kids right now, or, or, or lambs are going to be growing. Pregnant does or ewes are going to be also utilizing a lot of energy and a little more protein than normal. Um, and then any type of production. Okay, what's also kind of interesting about sheep and goat nutrition from a broad scope um, is compared to cattle, their voluntary dry matter, matter intake compared to their body weight is pretty high, um, especially goats. So they're the highest, about three to 5% of their body weight. And sheep are gonna be about two and a half to 4%. Classically, a sheep are gonna use that 4% of their body weight to estimate intake. And goats, I've been using about the same number in estimating intake, but. What is classified as dry matter? Dry matter, so it's just when you take any type of feed or anything like this, you could take this glove and if you put it in a dry oven and cooked it down and took all the moisture out of it, what's left? So it's any substance that you've just taken all the moisture out of. So as opposed to like an as fed basis, which is what, you know, if we scoop the feed out and put it in a bucket, that's the ad, as fed basis. Dry matter is just when you've taken all the moisture out. Yeah, it makes it easier to get a, a real estimate of intake because some feeds are going to be really, really high water content and other, like if you do like brewer's grains, really, really high water content versus, well, hay, it's going to be a lot less. Okay, so does how much a sheep or goat needs to eat change? I already have the answer on there, but yes, that's the answer. So it goes back to what are we expecting them to do? So if they're active, so I usually ask kids this, but when they're getting their goats or their sheep ready for show, are they dragging them around on a halter all the time or running them up and down the road or have them on a treadmill or all the stuff that people do with their show animals? That's a, a lot of activity. So we're going to have to feed them if we want them to build muscle while we're doing that to them, which is the whole reason why we're doing that stuff. So we're going to have to feed them or else they're actually going to lose muscle if we're not feeding them correctly. Um, if they're having lambs or kids, we're going to have to increase supplementation so that they have healthy lambs or healthy kids. The more offspring that they're going to have, the more we have to supplement because that's going to take a lot of energy. But we also are going to have to make the diets more dense because if you think about where she's carrying the babies and that big rumen, which probably all of the women in here that have had babies can testify to this, your stomach shrinks <laughs> because you're getting full of babies. Imagine having three or four inside of you <laughs> and having that big rumen. Well, it's gonna, she's gonna be able to, or she's gonna go from being able to eat that 5% of her body weight to that two and a half. And all within a matter of really 45-ish days, maybe even less. And so we're gonna have to go from her being able to maintain herself and her energy needs on grass to switching that to something really dense in protein and really dense in energy because she can't eat as much. And she's still trying to grow those babies. And that last part of gestation is where so much of the growth of those babies is occurring. Plus she's starting to produce milk. So huge energy pool on her, um, and she can't eat as much. So it's a, not a good situation, and that's where we can run into a lot of other problems that I'll talk about here in a minute too. Um, are the kids growing, or are, the, are you breeding ewe lambs or um, doelings? 
And if that's occurring, we're going to have to increase supplementation as well if we're going to be breeding them and they're growing and reproducing at the same time. Um, is it hot or cold? So animals, all animals pretty much want to eat less when it's hot. So if they're still growing, we're going to have to increase the density of the diet of nutrients compared to just normal temperatures. If it's cold, of course, that's a bigger energy pool on them, so we need to feed more. Um, are they growing fiber? That takes nutrition. Um, and producing milk, of course. Fiber, wool, or angora goats, cashmere goats. There's not really many cashmere goats here anymore, but there used to be a lot of angora goats, so um, there's still some. But yeah, so any wool, I know we're getting down into the territory where there's not a lot of wool sheep left down here anymore, but there used to be. Yeah, there used to be a ton of them. Um, okay, so what else do we need to consider? So you have to remember your goals, so market, breeding, showing, or if they're just a pet, because we're probably all guilty of making our dogs too fat. Um, but I think even more people are more guilty of making their pet sheep or goats too fat. I don't know if anyone has pet goats or sheep in here, but, um, but the other things we have to consider are weight. So if it's a smaller animal, they're, gonna be, they're consuming less because they're smaller, but they're growing, hopefully, if they're a smaller animal. And so we need to feed a more dense diet. Maturity, of course, mature, larger animals are going to consume more, but need less because they're not growing. Um, sex, so males consume more than females. And body condition, so if they are suffering from a low body condition, which I know someone's going to talk about that later, um, but I'm going to hit on a little bit here because I think body conditioning is extremely important. Um, but being at a low body condition score at the wrong stage of production is detrimental to that animal's lifetime and also the offspring's lifetime if she is pregnant. Okay, so another important note, I just said this a second ago, but smaller animals eat less. And so they're gonna require a higher quality diet, so higher energy, higher protein per pound of that ration, if that's how you wanna think about it. So on a percentage basis, it's gonna to have to be denser, and that's just compared to their larger counterparts. This is just kinda of to illustrate protein requirements. Um, this is in growing kids. So if we have a 44 pound kid and we want them to gain 0.22 pounds a day, we're gonna have to feed about 15% protein in the diet. But if we want them to gain twice that, 0.45 pounds per day, we're gonna have to feed between 20 and 25% protein. So the more we want them to grow, the denser the diet's gonna have to be because it, we're not changing how much they can eat because they're not gonna be able to eat more just because we put it in front of them, unless we're underfeeding. But that diet's just gonna have to be denser. That's all that means. 77 pound goat kid is gonna eat less or need less protein because it's not gonna have to gain as much to reach mature weight. Well, that's just, so it's total diet, total diet. So. I mean, so there's some haze out there that can help, you know, give you a good base. Feeds like distiller's grains and, oh, there's a couple out there, but that are going to, they actually have high rumen undegradable protein, so it's going to bypass the rumen. And is that soybean meal? Yeah, so soybean meal is really high in rumen undegradable, pro pretty high in rumen undegradable protein. It's, it's mm -hmm. In the rumen, yep. So you're, it's actually getting to the small intestine. Mm -hmm. But it's a really good supplement. A lot of times uh, protein pellets that you buy from a co-op or elevator will have some distillers in them already because it's just a cheap way to up protein. So. Um, but when we talk about protein, all proteins are not created equal. So it's kind of that rumen undegradable protein thing I'm talking about. So different protein feeds are gonna influence the amount of protein required in the diet. Because just because you're feeding a 22% protein diet doesn't mean that the animal is gonna get 22% protein because the bugs are gonna break that down and take part of that. 
if it's a lower quality protein. I mean, there's book values, so there's a, there's a ton of information online. Um, I use a book called the NRC, um, that's the, it's nutrient requirements, um, and there's a small animal version, or small ruminant version, um, and that's what I use a lot to get book values. Um, however, some of those values are not completely accurate, I will say that, um, and that's where you can test your feeds and send them off to a lab. Um, and that's another really good way to get the values. So you can look at like digestible protein, digestible energy, and <sighs> usually a really good test is anywhere from 18 to 20 bucks. And that's highly productive goats and sheep. You can honestly feed them like dairy cows mm -hmm. and you usually do pretty good. Yeah. So it's, cause they are, I, I, I always tell the grad, a lot of the grad students at K-State, because they just don't understand, especially sheep nutrition, they just don't get it. And I tell them they're probably the highest qualified sheep nutritionist out there because you can just, like sheep are like many dairy cows because they, really highly productive sheep have a lot of milk and they're having a lot of babies and we're, t we're asking a lot of them. And so we can feed them those really high quality diets and pay for themselves. It's totally fine to supplement, especially if you're just upping the alfalfa. So like a lot of people early gestation are just feeding, they're either still out on grass, depending on the time of year, or you're supplementing low quality grass hay or mid quality grass hay. And then you can start supplementing alfalfa as they start having higher requirements. And then, as you need more requirements, or they have more requirements, we can supplement corn or soybean meal or you know some type of protein supplement that's going to be higher than corn usually. Um, but it, I had never heard the don't feed alfalfa until the last six months. Really? Yeah. Um, but it's so someone told me that they had heard it because someone was saying, well, they won't mobilize the calcium from their bones if they are getting supplemental calcium. Okay, true, not true. Yeah. I have never seen anything that indicates that. So if they are consuming enough calcium in their diet, they don't have to take it from their bones. Mm -hmm. But the, the, so physiologically, mm -hmm. if you and I are consuming enough calcium in our diet, we don't have to take it from our bones. So, and they're the same way, but that mechanism that kicks in so all of a sudden when she starts making milk it actually takes about 72 hours if she needs more calcium she's not getting enough in the diet it'll take her body 72 hours to start at least to start pulling calcium out of her bones okay but she will go ahead and do it in 72 hours so as long as in that 72 hour period we're supplementing enough calcium for her needs yeah it shouldn't be a problem but I used to feed I don't, my, just a, my goats. Everyone did. Alfalfa. As long as they had alfalfa. And I never had any yeah. problem. And then, yeah. so now I'm down to this 15% pellet. Yeah. And, they does, and does that have alfalfa in it, though? No. It's, oh. it's just a, I think it's the pellet he's talking about. Oh. Have y'all ever heard that? About not feeding alfalfa? I you know, way back, because I graduated in 99. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the everybody's gone to the and I cannot I think that's probably where that's coming from. Yeah. So strange. So did it help in dairy cows with them? I think so. Yeah. If you're from Bysaw, you're probably in cow country and you can use cow cubes too. Yeah. Because they're more readily available. Yeah, we can get cotton seed cake and stuff. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Because that's a. There's a lot of goats on bikes from southeast Kansas, and those guys are running them with cows and they take their goats right along with the cows. Okay, 
Yeah, so I'm gonna have to. No, 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 it's totally fine. I think it's interesting that I've heard that lately. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to look into that more. Okay, so other considerations. So pasture-based diets are gonna require greater amounts of crude protein um, for the animal versus more concentrate type rations, so soy, soy corn-based type diets um, that are gonna require lesser amounts of crude protein just because it's a higher quality source of protein. Oh, these are just in here for your reference book type values. Your, your sources might fall somewhere <laughs> above or below this, but um, it's just an estimate. This is for grass and alfalfa hay. Um, but so <laughs> stocking rates, we can run sheep and goats at a higher stocking rate compared to cattle, of course, because they're smaller, but also because of the target um, that they have. As far as feed, um, and I know in Kansas with Cerisa, do you all have Cerisa issues in Oklahoma? Cerisa, Lespedeza? See, that, in Alabama we used to grow it too. I was like, this isn't a problem, guys. You just let the sheep and goats eat it. Yeah, <laughs> the cattle guys don't like that. <laughs> kill it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, that's like high, high quality hay in yeah, Alabama. I, I so in Kansas, we can run sheep and goats, especially goats, to consume cerisa and get it out of the cattle pastures, hopefully. Um, but goats, we can run about between six and seven goats per cow-calf pair and about five sheep per cow-calf pair. I know there's people in like northeast Kansas that say they run eight sheep different in different pockets, but those are about um, the right estimate. So, of course, goats are going to target browse. Um, preference shrubs, tree leaves, grass heads, um, and sheep are going to start targeting the grass heads and then go for anything below that. Typically, some of the hair sheep will kind of browse a little more than the wool sheep, um, but they're going to select from a very wide array of plants, and that's where they differ from cattle, where cattle are very focused on certain types of grasses, and goats and sheep both are going to have a very a much more diverse palette when it comes to plants. Um, but they will have preferred species. And so different times of the season, other, some things are gonna taste better than others to them. Um, so at different points in time, when different plants reach different stages of maturity, they're gonna have higher lignin or what we call tannins. Um, so cerisa is another one of those grasses that has or can at different points in time have high levels of tannins and cattle don't like high levels of tannins and that's why they typically don't like to eat cerisa. But tannins are really awesome for sheep and goat people because they're a natural dewormer. So if we can have them graze things that have high levels of tannins, we can actually help curb some of our parasite loads. Um, and actually sheep and goats like things like cerisa <coughs> and things like cedar at different points in time and juniper, which are all high in tannins. So it's kind of nice that the cattle don't like them because the sheep and goats can eat them and we can help reduce our parasite levels at the same time. So it's typically um, at the, like during growing. So it's right about now and a little bit later. So like April, late April to June. I know that's down in Texas. Oh, really? Yeah. It's probably because she's feeding them that high fat stuff. <laughs> no, not, the, not those goats. Yeah, they won't eat it? I mean, those are the pasture goats. Yeah. The pasture goats don't eat cedar. Yeah. We really? What they call a whorehound growing belly yeah. through the winter and yeah. the spring, but then they won't eat it if it's. Yeah. Dead. So usually they so they won't eat it if it's if they have something they'd rather eat. So it's all about preference. So we have so they ha they have to be trained in a way. Um, so we have the same thing in North Dakota. We would um, oh crap now I can't I just blanked on the name of the plant. Um, there was another invasive species of grass. And the sheep, people would say the sheep wouldn't eat it, but sheep actually will target graze it if they don't have something better to eat that they'd rather eat. 
but when you if you fenced them in around it, then they would eat it all day long. So it's all okay. So another stocking rate um, note: um, since they do have mineral minimal overlap with cattle um, in selection preferences, and even from sheep to goats, um, multi-species grazing it can be a really good tool or rotation of like co-species grazing. Um, and so the more diverse the pasture is, the higher stocking rates we can have, and that's really just the main takeaway from that. Okay, so some of the uh, nutrient composition of different browses. So blackberry, I thought this was kind of interesting. It's not awful, <coughs> and actually has decent levels of energy. Um, so some of the mesquite also has, can have high protein, um, but it's gonna be lower in energy. Grapevines, a lot of people are grazing around some of the vineyards. It's not good when they get the leaves, they don't like that, but there's still some energy value there. So mineral supplementation, a complete sheep or goat mineral should be offered year round and free choice. Um, I always tell people if they're over consuming, you can add salt to kind of try and regulate the mineral intake levels um, because salt isn't gonna kill them either. Um, so copper is essential for both sheep and goats. It's just that sheep typically get enough copper from their diet, and of course they have a sensitivity to high levels of copper. So don't feed them goat mineral or cattle mineral. So the only thing with giving blocks to sheep, and this can happen with goats too, is with a block, a lot of times they'll chip their teeth because it is so hard and pressed. Um, that over time, they can wear down their teeth a lot or chip their teeth. So what should we give them? I like loose mineral. Loose mineral. Well, I mean, we, I've also given blocks of mineral to sheep, so. And it, here, like further, the further east you get, the less of a big deal that is because we're feeding diets that are easier for sheep and goats to eat, even when they have chipped teeth or less teeth. And that's why Western sheep get chipped east when they're old, because it's easier for them to survive once they've worn their teeth down to the gums. But, and they're not gonna survive out on range. And that's why their teeth are chipped down and worn down to the gums, is because they've been grazing rocky pasture. So, yeah. Um, oh, so, the other important thing about minerals is uh, to check where you are on a selenium map, because some people are in really low selenium areas and other people are in really high selenium areas. So, um, and I don't know geography-wise where we lie here um, as far as selenium levels, but where I lived in North Dakota, we had really high selenium levels. Um, and we got high selenium in the meat which is not, a, it's not harmful or anything. Um, we would actually market the meat to China um, because they have really low selenium levels. And so we had a little program going for the people of China. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but as far as mineral supplementation goes, sometimes we have to up the selenium levels in the mineral packs because they're not getting adequate selenium. So sometimes you'll see deficiencies. Can you get too much selenium? I'm sure you can. I mean, they, there is a selenium toxicity, um, but have you ever seen a selenium toxicity? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I, and I was in a high selenium area and I've never seen one. I, I'm sure it can happen. The minute I say it can't happen, someone will be like, well, I had a selenium toxicity. <laughs> so I'm not gonna say it can't, but. It can. So anytime there's excessive moisture or the opposite, drought, plants are gonna pull nutrients out of the soil, especially minerals, differently. So high moisture, they're gonna be less dense in minerals, but just like with drought, when they pull nitrates out of the soil, they can also pull high levels of certain minerals. So yes. Which, it, and it likely, it could have been. And that's where it's, you can send off a sample and have it tested. And, 
It, it, I mean, it's nice, especially if something starts happening like that, because then that's a, it's a relatively easy fix. Of course, if you have weak kids, you can probably just give them a shot. And if this, yeah, yeah. BOCI yeah. makes them better, then, yeah. Okay, growing season of pasture. So usually vegetative growth um, is gonna be sufficient for most of our maintenance needs. Um, it's gonna meet protein, energy, vitamin requirements. They're still gonna need mineral year round. Mineral is very important. Um, nice thing is it's low cost. All of you know that, um, but feed mineral. Um, goats are gonna prefer the browse to the grass. Sheep are gonna prefer the forbs to the gra to grass and the browse. So graze your desired stubble height, but remember in the back of your mind that parasites are going to thrive when the grass is less than four to six inches high. So you want the stubble to be at least four inches high, preferably five or six inches high, because the larvae of parasites can't make it past usually that four to five inch mark. So that's why we encourage higher growth before you turn stuff out. Because if they're gonna graze below that, then they're gonna ingest more or higher parasite levels. Um, so allow adequate rest before the regrowth, or rest for regrowth, excuse me. Um, and whatever your key species of plants are on your pasture, um, measure those to the desired height because you don't want, if, you're, if you are selecting grasses, because um, I know for some people native pasture is a big deal and they want to keep that. If you are doing that, measure the species that are really important to you and make sure that they're the desired height before you turn stock back in. Okay, protein supplements, these are classic ones, alfalfa hay, cottonseed meal, soybean meal, peas. Anyone ever feed peas down here? Okay, that was a North Dakota thing, lots of peas. Um, but soybean meal, the cottonseed meal, and alfalfa hay are gonna be the classic uh, protein supplements. Um, does anyone feed the blocks, protein blocks or tubs? Yeah, those are really popular. Okay, energy supplements, so corn by far is gonna be the most popular, um, oats, barley, cobs. Um, so lower protein levels, higher energy. Okay, feed rules. So low quality grass hay is usually fine for maintenance level, like I said before, um, but if the females are pregnant, lactating, or any of them are growing, we're gonna have to supplement. Supplementation can be any of those protein or energy sources. Um, corn is normally fine. Um, corn, a little bit of alfalfa. Clean, fresh water is the most important thing. People, everyone tends to forget about the water, um, but they're not gonna eat if they don't have clean, fresh water. The other thing that is very important that, does anyone weigh their feed? Oh, you do? Oh, gold star. <laughs> So weigh your feed, um, because if we're looking at body condition scores to figure out if we need to adapt our ration to the body condition, if you don't know how much feed you're feeding, it's hard to adjust from that. Um, and I know you're, if you, some people say, well, I feed a five gallon bucket, so I feed less than a full five gallon bucket. Buy a little tabletop scale or a fish scale. <coughs> And it's just, it's really easy, and that way you have a reference, and you also can calculate how much your feed costs are. Um, so when we talk about breeding females, energy supplementation um, can be used to flush your, does anyone flush their females? Yeah. So one of the handiest tools for sheep and goats, um, flushing, just feeding a pound per head per day, two weeks prior to breeding, um, and we can increase our ovulation rates and reproductive success. Um, flushing actually can increase your lambing or kidding rates by 10 to 25 percent, so it's a lot. Um, but the most important thing is to remember that their highest nutrient requirement for goats is late pregnancy, for sheep is early lactation. Um, so we need to make sure that we're feeding adequate energy and protein levels at those two times, and we're going to avoid a lot of problems. Um, watch their feed intake, because if sheep or goats go off of feed for 12 
as little as 12 hours, 24 hours or more, um, and we're going to run into pregnancy toxemia or hypocalcemia. Um, so we can avoid those issues if we're monitoring feed intake. Because um, one of the biggest problems we've had, um, I know in Manhattan, producers all around there had preg tox issues really bad this year because our weather was all over the place. And every time we would get a random snowstorm or ice storm blow through, their sheep or their goats would go off feed and they would get around a preg tox. And it was all because they went off of feed because of the stress of the weather changing. Um, and if they had known, they could have at least addressed the problem. Um, the other thing that can lead to some major preg tox issues is if your pregnant does or ewes are too fat or too thin, but usually the problem's <coughs> on the too fat side. Um, so that's another body condition score, the animals, and have them at the adequate, correct body condition score at each stage. All right, so some issues. Prior to breeding, early gestation, mid gestation, late gestation, any stage um, can make them more prone to preg tox later on. But late gestation is the most vital time. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so phytoestrogens, probably most of you aren't going to have to worry about this. For people that feed things like peas, we can run into some of those problems. Preg tox or ketosis, twin kid disease, twin lamb disease, there's a lot of names for it. Um, basically, the animal female rapidly mo mobilizes their internal fat that they've already deposited um, because they're not, they can't consume enough energy through their diet. So if the doe or the ewe is really fat, they have a lot of that fat internally to mobilize, um, but she can't consume enough because she's full of lambs or kids. So. She starts mobilizing all of that fat. They go into a negative energy balance and they go down. And if we don't get glucose or some kind of energy in them really fast, they'll die. And you might lose the kids too, or the lambs. Um, not pretty and it's not fun, and, but usually can be avoided um, if it is body condition or diet or the stress from weather. Um, now, sometimes, of course, we can't help that, and sometimes it has nothing to do with management. It just happens. Um, the other one is milk fever, hypocalcemia. Um, that can occur prepartum or postpartum. Um, it's going to look relatively similar, similar to preg tox symptoms, um, but we give them calcium therapy, and I know um, most of the time we're, we just treat for both preg tox and hypocalcemia, um, just in case, because they can occur at the same time as well, um, and they can have both issues. So I always say err on the side of caution and treat for both, but the thing with um, calcium therapy is you can flatline a sheep or a goat quickly with giving calcium too fast, so you have to monitor heart rate, and that's where I say, if you're not comfortable, call your vet. Um, but you can supplement glucose and calcium for both issues. Um, so grass hay or pasture for the first three to four months of gestation is usually completely adequate. Alfalfa hay, sorry, sorry, during the last one or two months. Um, and then we can... Go back <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me know if you have problems. <laughs> um, but we can feed concentrate to balance anything we need above alfalfa hay. Um, and then offer free choice mineral or mix it in the ration to make sure they're getting adequate mineral. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about this too much because I know someone else is talking about it later. Body condition <coughs> score, even if you're don't only doing it a few times a year, start doing it because it is an easy thing to learn. It's an easy thing to teach yourself and incorporate. You're handling them anyway. Just do it because it can save you a lot of headaches. So the score, the scale is one to five, one skinny, five fat, but I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, this I put in here for reference. This is just a little chart graph that gives you kind of target body condition scores for different stages of production. I also put this in here because these are my two favorite. Hi, see, I did something Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> Langston has a really nice little ration balancer for goats. 
Um, and I really like this Montana State cheap ration calculator. Um, they're fun to kind of play with and they're pretty good um, and they're free. So nothing better than pretty good and free. So, okay, unique aspects of small ruminants. So we talked about preg talks. Multiple births lead to some of our major headaches. I always use this picture in every sheep or goat presentation that I do because I always say this is your optimal right here, even though that's five, it's five babies right there and nobody wants five babies. But if you can have five babies and you have a milk machine and you don't have to worry about doing bottle lambs, that's great because you can still raise those. And this ewe is in perfect body condition and she's a Texel. And if any of you know Texels, they're not supposed to have prolific genes at all. Um, but she had five, this is, this is the third year in a row that she's had five babies, so it's genetic. And so this producer has genetically selected for multiples. They only want triplets, they want all triplets, but they, with that you get some quads and you get some quints. So she's perfect body condition, just had these, got up, cleaned them off, nursed all five for a week, a week. Yeah, and then they took three of them off and put them on a milk machine. But awesome genetics, awesome management, both genetic selection-wise and nutrition. Because um, she sustained this through pregnancy three years in a row. And she's on an accelerated lambing program. So it's just awesome. It's awesome. Um, and the babies are now in the flock, and they're having babies. And it's, it's really cool to see um, what happens with really, really good selection and management and a nutrition program. All right, um, so when we talk about the babies, start them off strong, and this is where kind of go into when should we have them at different body conditions and different nutrition, but if you feed the female correctly from the time of breeding throughout gestation, the baby will be stronger, it will be more productive through its lifetime. If you wanna read research about this, fetal programming. Just Google fetal programming. And there is so much research out there about the effects of the mother's health and what that can do to the offspring. Um, and we know that the healthier she is, the better nutrition she has throughout pregnancy, the healthier the offspring is gonna be and the more productive and efficient they will be. So it's a very important thing to think about. Okay, the other thing is how do we feed the baby correctly once it's on the ground? So I personally like to put feed out before we ever start having lambs or kids. I like to, for it to be there when they hit the ground. Not that they're gonna eat it and jump up and eat it and go eat that before they nurse the mom. I know they're not going to, but at least it's there and they've seen it and they know it's there and they're gonna start eating on it the minute they get curious. Um, we have, or at the unit at the university right now, we have tons of babies, both kids and lambs right now, and they are all eating straw, because we bed with straw. They're eating straw, they're eating alfalfa, and they're eating the crap out of creep feed. And I mean, and they're, they're, we have like a three month range right now, and all of them age wise. And um, they're, I mean, they're doing great. And it's, we keep creep feed out. They stay full, it's out there. Um, and I'm a firm believer in it, so, so that's me. Um, but we, um, I like to feed a meal, and we like to, or I like to top dress it. It's not what we do at the unit, um, but I like to top dress alfalfa or some prairie hay, whatever you have. Um, but the alfalfa tends to be a little bit more palatable for them, and if you're feeding that to your ewes and they see you eating it or dough, they're going to tend to eat that better too. But Mainly, you want something that's small and easy for them to grab, whether that's micro pellet or a meal, um, highly palatable and high fat. Um, this is just an example, y'all can look at that. Um, some people like to put ammonium chloride in the creep feed if it's a mix, um, just to curb any incidence of um, urinary calculi. That's just a show feed example, but Okay, so medicated and non-medicated feed, we can increase not only our efficiency, um, but also shift that microbial environment um, to something a little more favor favorable with feeding lasalicid, Bovitec, or Menensin. Um, it's called an ionophore. Don't get caught up in that. 
um, but it also can act as a coccidia side. Um, so if you have coccidia issues, this can kind of help curb that. Um, some people aren't fans of them. If you're not, that's totally fine. Um, but it can help with the coxy issues. Um, decox is also another one we can put in the feed. I didn't put Corid up here because if they're not drinking water, then and it's hard to monitor if you're just mass feeding Corid, um, whether or not everything's getting the right amount. Um, so I, I like it in feed. Um, but that's just my personal preference. Cord is an awesome product. It's awesome if you're drenching with it too. Um, I just prefer feed products, but urinary calculi, I wanted to hit on this one real quick. So if you haven't seen it, that's what it looks like. They're all stretched out usually uh, once it starts getting pretty painful to them. This is another reason fresh water is really important if you're feeding concentrate feeds or any other time. Um, but you want to make sure that your calcium to phosphorus ratio is at least two to one, and it's going to help curb any of these issues. If you're feeding high concentrate, high levels of corn, um, supplement ammonium chloride or limestone in the diet so that they're getting adequate calcium. Um, bucks and rams, protein prior to breeding, protein in the diet is good. Um, it's going to help them gain condition, but it's also going to help sperm production. Um, overfeeding is not good. You do want them at a little bit higher level body condition score going into breeding because hopefully they're running around like crazy breeding and they're going to lose some of that. But we don't want them to be fat because then they're going to be less likely to want to breed um, because they're fat. Um, so a pound per head per day, grain, it's usually about the rule of thumb, but body condition and adjust accordingly. So this rules for changing feed. So do it slowly, very gradually. Um, if you're gonna change the type or the amount, take your time. Um, introduce about a quarter pound per day. Um, feed, try to feed at the same time each day, give or take <coughs> half an hour. Um, and if you can't do that or you're a little worried about it, you can feed twice per day and do an even better job of curbing some of the issues. Okay, so summary. Identify your nutritional needs of your animals at whatever stage of production they are. Remember that they're going to change. They should change. Um, match your animal requirements to the value of your feeds. So if you don't know the value of your feeds, you can't do that. Um, and then use body condition score to fine tune your program, your nutrition program. And always have mineral and clean water. And with that, I'll take any questions. That's my email. Um, at the end, there should just be some example rations or example goat rations, because I figure that's more of what people need. If you need example sheep rations, I have a lot of those. Or if you just need help adjusting rations, I would love to help anybody.